And I'm going to get rid of my slide quite quickly as well, too. I'm Lisa White, and I'm Director of Lifestyle Interiors and Future Innovations at WGSN. I'm American, I live in Paris, and I work in London, which makes me travel all over the world um, quite a lot. But we have offices all over the world as well, too, in Sao Paulo, in Beijing, in Shanghai, in Cape Town, in LA, in New York. So it's really about global trends here. And we've been in the business for about 20 years now, too. And I know we're going into 2020, and I know your strategy is in place for 2020, but my job today is to bring you a bit forward into 2021 and beyond. Oh, voila, that moved over there too, there we go. So this is just a tiny bit about our methodology. It's a very exhaustive chart, and it takes a look at our quantitative and qualitative research. So on the left, we've got big data and retail analytics, and on the right, is qualitative research, it's speaking to people, it's observing market trends, it's observing product trends and design trends, and both will be necessary for you to win in the future. So our proposition basically um, uh, you know, makes you help, or helps you I should say, create the right relevant products that people will love and want to keep and pass down through generations. It's really important for us to think about objects as things that we love, as totems, as Raims once said, the objects that evoke meaning. So what I'm gonna do now is take you into our future trends, um, because only by understanding the challenges and opportunities will brands navigate and survive. So the six trends for the future, are going to be the age of systems, which is actually more than a trend. These are really more movements than anything else. Trends tends to be a word that makes you think about a color that's going to last for six months. This is not what this is about. These are about long-term movements that are starting now that you will recognize and that will be going far into the future. So the age of systems is really one that's going to be happening for the next couple of years. The end of more as well too, the home hub, uh, the age gap, new networks and digital craftsmanship. So the age of systems. In an increasingly complex world, we will require a powerful combination of design thinking and systems thinking to address the economic, political, and societal challenges. So bringing these areas together, we'll see issues reframed as opportunities, as Mr. Ely said earlier, where design and creativity can be used to develop long-term solutions for people, the environment, and business. So designing better systems will become even more crucial than the design of the products themselves. Many businesses are still working with outdated systems and this is hurting them. So in the future, we're going to move from product-focused design towards systemic design. For, for example, replacing linear supply chains with circular resource models. It's now time for brands to rethink your internal systems to maximize long-term opportunities. So long-termism is something that is a very interesting um, thing that we are seeing not just in creativity but also in business because in many ways people are thinking too short term. They are thinking about shareholder value and not stakeholder value, not thinking about employees and society in general. So companies that are seduced by short-term metrics are going to be the detriment of their long-term health. And this long-term thinking that we're seeing is quite interesting. This is a chart from two ad executives who got out of advertising and established the long time project to think more radically about the future. So as you can see in the bottom here, nature's been around for millennia. Um, then we move up to culture and governance and infrastructure and commerce. And then fashion, not so long. So they really encourage us to make better decisions for the future and to think like a good ancestor. So some businesses that are experimenting with this long-term um, thinking uh, are trying to make it more commercial because they realize it's vital to their brand. For example, Clarence on the right unveiled its long-term project to become a 100% field-to-jar brand. They acquired 200,000 acres of land in the Alps to grow and study plants for their future products. Lexus on the left applied long-term thinking through the lens of craftsmanship. And the auto brand created a 6,600 hour documentary about four Japanese artisans and showing the thousands hours of practice and dedication it takes to develop skills. So again, to um, long term, I like to say that long term prosperity is process, purpose, people and provenance over product and short term profit. And this is something that's been backed up by uh, Larry Fink, chairman and CEO of investment powerhouse BlackRock. 
He wrote earlier in this year to CEOs, and I'm sure many of you have read this, as we enter 2019, commitment to a long-term approach is more important than ever. The global landscape is increasingly fragile and as a result susceptible to short-term behavior by corporations and governments alike. I know a few governments like that. And he also said, society is increasingly looking to companies, both public and private, to address pressing social and economic issues. These issues range from protecting the environment to racial inequality, companies. Companies that fulfill their purpose and responsibilities to stakeholders reap rewards over the long term. And he is an investment banker. Now let's go into the systems a bit. And the systems that affect climate change are front and center as they influence politics, economics, migration, and many other areas. So we're seeing this concern for nature coupled with advances in technology creating some really interesting systemic advances. And so let's take a look at a few examples. As you know, water is becoming increasingly scarce, and I myself have lived this recently in places as far as flung as California, Cape Town, and Corsica. Water shortages, nothing coming out of the tap. It's a reality. So we're looking at some of these companies, these water companies, we've got amazing ones in Italy, also in France. They're trying to think about their future and how they need to change their systems, because they might not have a product in the future. It's a luxury, basically. And avian supply chain remains its most important asset. So they have really committed to making sure that they do not um, overextend the water they extract from the earth. They basically committed also to um, opening a new carbon neutral bottling facility. And by 2025, to have full circularity with their plastics and new systems to extract from recycled plastics something that looks very pure that you would want to put water in as well, too. But they also need to communicate about their efforts, especially to Generation Z, who is being very, very critical about all of this. Who needs bottled water? I mean, I know I've stopped drinking it in many cases. It really does feel like a luxury. But they're saying, listen, we need to communicate what we do. And so they've gone to YouTube, which is a channel that obviously Gen Z loves, to talk about um, what they're doing in a way that's very compelling. And they partnered with Vice for that. They also partnered with Virgil Abloh for a campaign, One Drop Can Make a Rainbow, talking about um, the virtues of buying water in glass bottles that could be recycled as well, and having always your water bottle with you, your glass water bottle. And this one looks really stylish because it's Virgil. VM systems are very important too, and fashion designer Roland Mouret compared hangers to the plastic straw throw away objects that are damaging the environment. He says single-use plastic has too much presence in luxury life. It's estimated that 100 billion hangers are produced and used this way every year, with 85% 80, ending up in landfill. And so when clothes are shipped, as you know, from factories to stores, they're put on cheap hangers that are immediately discarded when they arrive at the shops to be on more beautiful hangers. And Mouhe calls this fashion's dirty secret. So he collaborated with Arch and Hook to create a new hanger called Blue, which debuted at London Fashion um, Week last month. And the British Fashion Council has teamed up to make this more of a reality across the board. Because, as Mr. Ely said earlier as well too, we can't do it alone. We need to work with other companies, maybe very different companies, to make sure that we can move things forward together with better systems. And there's very exciting tech systems as well, too. I'm particularly inspired by the Internet of Textiles, which is transforming fabrics into network devices. And you've probably heard of Google's Project Card, who have worked with Levi's, for example. So you have a jacket, which is actually not very expensive. It's under $200. And you can um, change your music, answer the phone, just by swiping the cuff of your jacket. And their newest product is with Yves Saint Laurent, a backpack. With the same thing with the, uh, the strap of your backpack, you can actually change your music or even take pictures. One of the things I find very exciting is Benjamin Hubert's collaboration with Airbus down at the, the right. And he's developed a smart textile for economy class seats. And this textile you sit in, depending on your weight and how big you are, it actually comes in and hugs you a bit. It also um, changes depending on your temperature if you want to be colder or warmer. It can remind you to get up and move, and it's actually called move, and also to go and hydrate. So you end up after your flight, even in an economy class, feeling fresher. It's kind of like a hug. And then product design systems. There's many product designers here in this room, but this was one of my favorite ones from the, the last Salone. And it's Pantron Turon, who create ultra-light, sustainable, tool-free furniture. An entire living room, a chair, a table, three lamps, and a screen weighs only 20 kilos and gets flat-packed. This is perfect for people who rent. 
It's perfect for people who are global nomads, and it's perfect for all of us who don't want to have the weight of furniture moving around with us. And then sourcing and growing systems is really important. Last year, we talked about lab-grown diamonds and the quality that's happening with those right now, too. Right now, I wanted to talk about opals because I think that's going to be a stone that is very, very interesting because it's sort of like the unicorn or the mermaid of stones. It's got a lot of digital magic as well, too. Um, on the right are some lab-grown opals by Sente in Japan, and they're quite beautiful. And if you take a look at them and remember something, remember this for a slide I'll show you the, um, in a little bit, which is digital, you'll see that an opal is sort of a digital stone. And on the left is uh, Ling Jun Sun's ethically um, and ecologically sourced opal. He worked as an opal cutter in Australia for 10 years and then went to Central St. Martin's, got his master's, and is really working to make the opal very, very modern. So our second trend is the end of more. And this is very, very important because consumption will be decreasing over the next 10 years by maybe even as much as 50%. Low impact consumerism becomes more mainstream and interest in sustainable processes and products rises globally with everyone, even in emerging economies. Attention is beginning to shift to reducing the amount of new raw material and new things um, to reused, recycled, and renewed types of things as well, too. Our customers are aware of this importance. In the future, people will want access over ownership. Instead of having more things, they will simply just want their desires fulfilled. And we will look at more of an immaterial economy based on emotion, experience, and knowledge. People will also be looking for quality over quantity in their consumption, and you're very well placed here in this room for that message. So as businesses adapt to appeal to more conscious consumers, they also will find that the opportunities will generate cost savings, estimated at $60 billion by 2030 in Europe alone. So you do the right thing, you save money and the planet at the same time. Glo going circular pays, and we are seeing that a lot of really interesting companies are using their own raw materials, so you don't have to buy new raw materials to make new things. So IKEA is creating new product ranges from its own waste materials, so if you make waste, use it. Etat Libre d'Orange is um, there in the middle on the bottom. Uh, in 2018, they came out with a perfume called I Am Trash, which was reusing some of their essences and squeezing the last bit of fragrance out of them to make sure they got everything from the natural materials possible. And then over there on um, the right is the LVMH prize finalist, Duran Lantink. And he partnered with Browns in London uh, to change the definition of dead stock. And as you know, we're no longer in many countries, including especially France, allowed to burn dead stock, which is a huge advance in, fa in the fashion system. So what he does is he cuts up and repieces designer dead stock and creates one-of-a-kind items that are absolutely gorgeous, kind of a mashup of luxury brands. And in the middle there, too, do you remember last year, Natsai Audrey Chesa, who came and spoke about the way that she has found a, a way to color fabrics with using bacteria, which is something we normally avoid, which is considered waste, to dye things with much, much less water and a lot of beauty. It seemed like a kind of an out-of-the-box uh, out the sort of thing last year. Um, but quite frankly, this year she just won the Index Design Prize and was elected one of the most important people in London, one of the most influential. So that type of thing is going very, very fast. And so we're looking at resourceful essentials using natural materials that are either abundant or, of course, waste. And here I wanted to look at biodesign because remember last year, too, Paolo Antonelli had invited some amazing um, biodesigners. There was Broken Nature at the Triennale, at the Pompidou Center, at the Saint-Étienne Biennale, and now at the Cooper Hewitt, also at, uh, in New York. So these are two young designers working with seaweed, which is very, very abundant in our warming oceans. Canadian-Iranian designer Roya Agigi on the left has created clothes made from algae that turn carbon di uh, dioxide into oxygen through photosynthesis. So you're actually photosynthesizing the air when you wear these products. On the right is the work of design futurist Charlotte McCurdy, and she reframes the idea of light as an energy source. When you have a normal raincoat, oftentimes it's coated in something that is a petrochemical, some sort of plastic, and that is using ancient sunlight. The petrochemicals come from the, the animals and the, the plants that died millennia ago. But she says if we use um, uh, seaweed, we're working with current day sunlight, and that is a much more sustainable way of acting. 
And this is also really important for you too. Now we're going very retail here. Um, re-commerce is getting big and it's only going to get bigger and that's a good thing. This reverse supply chain retrieves used product from consumers and makes it available to others. Between January 2018 and June 2019, the resale app Depop, which originated here in Italy, doubled its user base to reach 13 million people worldwide. They recently collaborated in store with Selfridges and also with Ralph Lauren in London. So they're actually coming to the fore in actual stores. Um, and then on the right uh, here, we also have Real Real and Burberry, which very recently created a partnership. So any Burberry item that you own that is, you know, lightly worn and you want to give back or to resell, you can go and put that on Real Real and you get points with Burberry. And those points give you special moments and experiences in the stores if it's a high tea or access to certain types of sales. And so that, again, is building more brand um, uh, clout with uh, people and making sure that more people get access to Burberry as well. And on the left, this is something really new and interesting from the States. Welcome to the era of social selling. This is called Store. It's an app, S-T-O-R-R. -R. And basically, you can set up a store and you can have your friends buy from you. It's based in San Francisco, the app in any case. You can um, make your own shop. They have 175 retailers like Adidas or Redone Denim. You go and you pick the things that you like. You curate your own store in three swipes. It's free for you. You've got your store online. And again, your friends can buy from you. And that's happening in the States because people say, I'd rather give my money to my friend than to some company that I don't even know. And it doesn't cost them more. The people who are selling get anywhere from 5 to 30% commission. So it's another venue. For, um, for selling. And this is actually really important. I like to say buy great basics and rent the fun. You guys are definitely there for great basics and for fun as well too. And the rental economy has arrived with luxury. On the right is Panoply. It's a new online luxury fashion rental brand based in France. They work with 40 designers from Carvin to Kenzo, Etro and Valentino. And you can rent an item or have a monthly subscription for 69 euros. And you can also buy the gently used items as well. So people can experiment more with style and have fun with it. And basically on the left there is my dream. What I would love next year, next time I come to Milan for the Salone, I arrive at my hotel and I have pre ordered things that I want to rent. So on the bed of my hotel, I have luxury items that are absolutely gorgeous so I can live like an Italian when I'm here and I don't have to bring a suitcase. I think it's ridiculous to see people wheeling suitcases past stores in Italy or Amsterdam or Paris when they can actually just rent these clothes and then give them back at the end and try something new and maybe they end up buying it in the end. And this is actually a new startup called Gibbon and they were at the Copenhagen Fashion Summit and it's for Asians who are coming over to Europe right now in Amsterdam and soon in London who don't want to have to buy and pack a coat. If you're coming from Singapore, you don't need that coat or that sweater. And that means you can get into London, you can have an amazing coat that you can rent for the weekend, you can look like a Londoner, and you can give it back at the end. So I think it would be fantastic for a bunch of you in this room maybe to work together to create an amazing rental model for Milan. And it could even go for beauty products as well too. And I just want to leave this chapter um, with a book recommendation. It's a bit controversial, but there's some interesting things to consider. In his book, More From Less, which was just published, um, uh, the founder of MIT's Initiative for the Digital Economy, Andrew McAfee, suggests there's a new reason for being optimistic about the future. We are past the point of peak stuff, he says, and we're going to a process of dematerialization. And one of the best examples is our smartphone. Remember back in the day when you had to have a telephone, a TV, um, a stereo, and a camera? Now all you need is a smartphone. And though they are far from being sustainable, we have a lot less objects in the world right now. So it's an interesting book. You should take a look at it. <clears throat> the third trend here is the home hub. And I find this one to be particularly important because our relationship to the idea of home is changing. And so is what we do in this space as our home habits are evolving. It's becoming a key space for comfort from the craziness in the world outside and for community as well too. It's fueled by millennials who spend 70% more time at home than the general population. And the shift is more about retreating. It's about optimizing the home as a system to make more time for meaningful experiences inside and outside of home. 
So staying at home is becoming easier and more aspirational. But I would say too that feeling at home with a brand is going to be important. Do people feel at home with you? Can they relax with you? Even if they're not going into your store, even if they're visiting online, how can people feel at home with you? We need to think of brands as homes and sometimes even as safe spaces. So in the future, we'll be able to do many more things in the home. We now see restaurant delivery happening in the home. We see the cinema happening at home with Netflix. And one of the next things we'll be seeing is the gym. Because oftentimes when you go to the gym, you just go and you work out. Do you really communicate with the people who are there? So actually bringing the gym into the home means you can work out more. And on the left here is Mirror. And it's a live stream fitness class um, that comes to your home. You buy the mirror, it's $1,500, and then you have classes that you can sign up for. And they are live classes. You've got a coach and you've got other people, and you're all interacting, but within your home. We're seeing an increase in home comforts as well, too. In the bottom right is Parterre. It's a heated rug system from France that creates warm zones to heat the body rather than the whole room. It's also very beautiful and blends into the decor and just makes people feel that much cozier. And last year, we talked about the importance of aftercare, making sure that people can repair and care for the things that they buy from you and to live, you know, let your products live the longest and best life possible. And we're seeing this is going to extend to the home. The French philosopher Gaston Bachelard wrote in his book, Poetics of Space, a house that shines from the care it receives appears to have been rebuilt from the inside as though it were new. We can sense how a human being can devote himself to devote himself to things and make them his own by perfecting their beauty. So we see caring for the home, even sweeping and cleaning is a type of mindfulness. In the UK, um, Sophie Hinchcliffe has almost 3 million followers on Instagram. They all say her devotion to home cleaning has inspired them and helped them with anxiety issues. So we're seeing taking care of the home as a mindfulness thing as well too. There's a big opportunity here for home products and we're seeing a lot of them being on a beauty level, something that you could put on your skin as well as on your countertop. And cleaning can also be sexy. It's about having an even more intimate relationship with your home. We're seeing more products and ingredients that work for, again, like the body. And this is a brand called Supernatural. And some of the client quotes on their site are, um, I love cleaning with your products. No, not only leaves my countertop sparkling, but lickable. And another said, I've never felt sexy cleaning until now. So there's a bit of white space there. You can go beyond the candles and go into the cleaning. And the idea of home comfort is extending to public spaces and retail. Um, we're seeing them soften and becoming more home-like to welcome customers in and put them at ease, as I was saying earlier. They don't have to worry about pollution, the weather, social unrest when they're in that space. And there's a couple of really interesting ones that are also community builders too. And you know Gwyneth Paltrow with Goop. She just opened a market um, in Toronto, and first time in Canada. And of course, they offer the you know, beautiful uh, products across fashion, home, and beauty. It's a very beautiful space. It's very soft. You've got a lot of curtains and spaces where you can sit down and relax. It really feels more like a hospitality space um, or a cozy home. But they also have workshops where you can work on no makeup beauty, so just making your skin look glowing. Um, and so it's really important here to think about when you go into that space or when you make a space for people, space shapes behavior. How do you want people to behave and how you want people to feel when they're leaving your space? And we're also looking at cars as well too, becoming much more home-like, especially when we'll have driverless cars. And this is the BMW Vision Next. And it's really um, lots of soft suedes, it's beautiful woods, because those cars are going to become places where you can do so many other things. You can relax, you can read, you can look out the window, you don't have to drive all the time unless you want to. And on another note, a UK car insurance brand temp cover Recently, recently released a survey that showed that many Brits are having sex in their cars more than ever before because there's not a lot of space. People are you know, co-sharing space all the time and if you're even living in the country or in the city. And they're really finding that um, the cars are becoming an intimate space in, the, in that way and they even broke it down by car model. So for the you car manufacturers, you might want to check that one out to see how you fare. And now we're going to get back to public spaces because we're seeing the return of private members' clubs. And these are intended to be a home away from home and make you feel at home in the world. 
for, from New York to London to Singapore. And they're based around people who want to um, be a bit more active as well too. Top right, the conduit in London is for those focused on social and environmental change. The Straits Club underneath in Singapore is for prog progressive opinion leaders and content creators. And on the left is Ethel's Club, which is the first members club that has been designed for people of color. And now we need to talk about the age gap, and that was brought up earlier. In many parts of the world, the population is living longer at a time of falling birth rates. And this scenario is starting to cause intergenerational friction as younger people are faced with picking up increased tax bills for long-term elderly care. So governments are moving in to make sure that people stay happier and healthier longer. And there's an opportunity for business and brands to become champions and facilitators of this as well too. At the same time, in other parts of the world, especially in emerging economies, the population is growing younger and brands need to know how to address these opportunities. And even in these emerging areas, everybody is already digitally savvy and moving into middle and higher income ranges. So it's an opportunity for you. But let's look at Asia in particular with the silver tsunami boomers, a wave of older people. They are, believe it or not, curious and independent, and they are prioritizing themselves by exploring creative ways to bring vitality into their lives. So it's about their happiness, investing more time in money and leisure, travel and wellness. And they've shown much more um, rapid online penetration than you would think. So we need to have a more age-inclusive mindset when we th are thinking about older people. And then parallel to these boomers, there's a surge in youth populations in Asia, specifically Southeast Asia. So the median age for most Southeast Asian countries is below 30 years old. And this is a big contrast to some of the older ones, like Korea and Japan, where the median, median age is above 40. But the next youth superpowers, all eyes are on Africa and India right now. Uh, more than half of India's population is under 25, and by 2050, Africa's youth population will increase by 50%, making it the most youth populated continent in the world. And as you know, the luxury industry is being reinvented by youth population and their interests, particularly with, st with street style. On the left, left is Yo Hood, a luxury streetwear event which is held annually in Shanghai. The latest summer, they imagine Asia in the year 3019, like a millennia from now, um, as a youth quake. And Days China magazine was launched at the event. And it's interesting because the Days Deep Streetwear cross-border ecosystem is being brokered by Adrian Cheng, who you will see just a bit in a video. On the right, it's Vietnamese youth that are hungry to participate in global culture and commerce. There's a new store there called the There VND Then, and it's a multi-form concept store that brings outside brands into Vietnam, but also fosters local brands as well, because no matter what, you need to collaborate with the local and the global. So how will brands speak to the old and the young? From boomers and Gen Z, we can see that both young and old consumers are being are increasingly tech savvy. So digital platforms and social media need to be balanced here. On the left is TikTok and Douyin, the Chinese equivalent. Um, with the user base of creative teens, short form video app TikTok has emerged as the new content hub that drives hit songs, products, and marketing campaigns. It's the fastest growing and most exciting app today for brands to connect with Generation Z. And so it's a short video sharing platform. It's generated more than 1 billion downloads, um, with 663 million of those occurring in 2018. So it's gone way past Vine, its predecessor. But that's the, the younger population. The older population on the right, we're seeing a lot of seniors engaged with digital. Lenovo, the brand, came up with the world's first senior esports team. Based in Stockholm, they're called the Silver Snipers, and they have an average age of 67. So it's challenging that assumption that older people are not interested in the digital. And then another way of connecting older and younger generations is through experiences, and we're calling this environmental therapy. So one of the things that you can take a look at is inviting people when they do go outside into spaces that make them feel well. Um, we take a look at you know, Westfield, for example, big mall company, and they're taking a look at how environmental therapy with hanging sensory gardens and open walkways will make people feel better. And they're calling these betterment zones as well, too. So again, this is something that appeals to older people and younger people at the same time. It's like those amazing shopping malls in Asia where you see people going there as a family to have an experience and moments together. And our fifth trend is new networks. 
Last year, I presented all-clusive design. And design for all will ramp up in 2021 as universal design strategies are adopted by governments, institutes, and brands alike. Consumer demand for inclusive design grows and diversity, diversity will be recognized and celebrated across a much more fuller spectrum. And you should know too that governments are involved in this. The Norwegian government has set a goal for the country to be inclusively designed by 2025 in five years. So tackling dis uh, discrimination, inequality, and boosting the nation's economic and social sustainability. So they're rethinking about how hotels, public transport, and hospitals will make everything more accessible to everyone. But inclusion goes way beyond what we're thinking about, inclusion of sexes and races and different physical abilities. It's also about mental abilities too. We're talking about neurodiversity and it's a rising topic on the art scene. New London Gallery Heart Club is dedicated to raising the profiles of neurodiverse artists and offering positive representation. And they're changing the language around mental diversity and exposing that creative power of thinking differently. And this drawing is by David Bassadon. He's 72 years old and he's been drawing for 50 years and was ignored until now. Um, he's on the autistic spectrum and he's, he's got a photographic memory and an attention to detail that is amazing. So these are the type of artists we need to be supporting. And it includes also artists from different ethnic backgrounds, which leads us to the idea of pluriversal thinking and design, a name coined by Colombian-American anthropologist Arturo Escobar in his publication last year, Designs for the Pluriverse. And it's dedicated to challenging conventional Western knowledge with a wider diversity of perspectives, especially from the cultures that have been on Earth for a long, long time, like pre-Columbian populations in North America, African cultures, or Aborigines in Australia. We need to know and remember that they still have what we have lost. They have a connection to nature that we don't have anymore, and learning from them is precious. On the left, we see First Nation Canadian artist Uluzi Saila, and she's fighting just to get her art produced and then also paid for in a way that's equal to her white Canadian counterparts. On the right is Barbara Sanchez Kane. She's a Mexican fashion designer who addresses national identity, gender equality, and immigration. Her collections are very loud, they're very activist. And uh, she does a lot of performance art with her fashion collections, which are absolutely amazing. And this was her show at Palais de Tokyo in Paris, a performance piece that she did. And it relates to pre-Columbian art as well. And we're seeing retail slowly becoming more inclusive as well. My favorite expression of inclusion is still um, by Verna Myers, the VP of inclusion at Netflix. And she says that diversity is being invited to the party Inclusion is being asked to dance. So we can't just pretend to be inclusive. We have to do so actively. And that includes your teams as well, too. You can't design for inclusion if your teams are not inclusive and have people from all sorts of spectrums and colors and ways of life. But back to retail. This is Cold Drops Yard, this gorgeous, gorgeous new um, shopping place in London designed by Thomas Heatherwick. Um, and in between the lovely Cos and Caravan stores, they've got another store called the Store Store. And it's um, dedicated to promoting design, craft, and the arts, now that funding for those has been cut from schools in the UK. They offer free after school and summer school classes in making things to get kids designing who normally don't have access. And they'll learn to design ice cream cones or bookends like you see here as well too. So it's really bringing that next generation up with craft. And at the very least, to begin the inclusion process, brands need to be sensitive to local culture and concepts of luxury. And you need to focus on unique retail spaces that coexist with local communities in Asia, for example. On the left is Icono Siam, Bangkok's newest and largest mall to date. And it celebrates Thai culture by allowing the many luxury brands within the mall to express their connection with Thailand. They have a small floating market on the ground floor at Louis Vuitton, displays look like Thai pagodas, and the use of Thai silk throughout is really um, designed to reflect the, chip, the rippling river next to them too. And on the right is Jong Chun 175, a new shopping center in South Korea, and they've got a market as well too with small local businesses that are included with the luxury. 
And this is just one last sign. This is going a little bit too far, perhaps. It's about respectful design and not putting human beings at the center of everything. So it removes the human beings from the center of the universe and focuses on a more holistic vision that concentrates on the connections between all life forms, such as plants, animals, and even minerals. And on the left, this is um, a show right now at the Fondation Cartier in Paris on trees. And um, my favorite thing there was an Italian scientist, Stefano Mancuso, who basically has put forward the fact that trees communicate. Since they can't move, they communicate with one another through volatile organic compounds, a bit like perfume. And there's some videos he's worked with an artist to create the fact and the way that trees communicate with one another. You should definitely see if you can partner with him with all these trees that are happening here in Milan. And on the right, even rocks um, can be sentient. And if you take a look at the Aboriginal populations in Australia, just this last week, they said that you can no longer climb Ayers Rock. It's not for tourists to be walking on, it's a sacred space. And one of the locals said, Ayers Rock needs a rest. And this is my last trend. It's all about digital craftsmanship. And as you know, today's consumers increasingly straddle both the physical and digital realms. It's um, forward-thinking brands and retailers are adopting extended reality, which is a mix of virtual and real-life technology to prepare for the shift. We'll see more product-less stores with more immersive and engaging shopping journeys, and even digital-only clothing and interiors. So this is definitely for the Gen Z, for sure, and millennials who are used to going back and forth. But none of this that I'm going to show you is real. This is all digital. So what's interesting about this, too, is you don't necessarily need to create product physically. And that's also gaining a lot of resources that you're not using as well, too. And these systems will be growing, especially with the arrival of 5G in 2020. So one of the most talented digital designers out there is Lucy Hardcastle. And she's recently worked with both Bentley and Chanel to take their brands further. And she goes to traditional arts such as glass blowing and painting to inform her digital shapes and textures. These are very immersive and very moving. She says to me, craftsmanship, and that's the video she created there on the right, craftsmanship and art correlate to the relationship I have with materials. I believe that craft is about developing a collaborative relationship with whatever material you're using, whether it's digital or physical. Equally, as an artist, it's important to have that connection. And so this is something that she worked on with Bentley for their um, latest 100 GT, the concept car that was de designed to mark um, the, their brand centenary. And this is what she did with Chanel. And her idea here was to make the invisible visible. This is inspired by Chanel Number no. 5 perfume. And you can feel it. of time, I'll cut that off, but you definitely need to take a look at it. And at some point in the future, you may be making digital-only products. You may be doing that now as well, too. And this is um, the concept of digital fashion house Fabricant. And they merge digital design, visual effects, and traditional pattern cutting to create fully digital collections. And they just sold the dress on the right in May for $9,500. And I know that sounds crazy, but if you think about it, Generation Z spends a lot of their time in digital communities, and they have multiple identities. They need clothes for each of those identities. And they want to dress and present themselves in new ways all the time. Last November, Scandinavian retailer Carlings released its first digital-only um, clothing collection. So customers sent a photo that um, Carlings would dress um, and they basically created a collection that you had about 12 pieces of each. It could be a shirt or it could be um, a dress, and it sold out immediately. And they were only about 10 to 30 euros, though, so it's kind of the opposite on that scale as well, too. So the idea is you can wear something new on Instagram or TikTok without actually having to physically wear it or buy it or have it produced. So brands are now working with companies as well, too. The Fabricant is working with Li and Fung, for example, to do all of their prototyping digitally. So you no longer have to send prototypes back and forth. That's how good it is. 
And it also, which is really important here too, um, digital personas are coming to the fore. And I hope you are all following Lil Mikaela on Instagram. You need to. Um, we have a, part, a marketing case study just on her. She's a 19-year-old digital avatar. She's not real. She's an influencer with 1.7 million followers on Instagram. She's Brazilian American, she's lovely, she's personable, she has, you know, mood, she gets sad, she gets happy, she gets excited, and she dresses beautifully, obviously only digital. And she's been doing amazing collaborations with brands and long-term ones too, like with Samsung, and also with Coachella. She works with music musicians, she can do anything. And she's not um, a model or somebody who is going to disappoint you or let you down with any type of behavior as well too. On the left there is Bjork's avatar, and she recently created with James Mary a full-on VR experience that you can ex um, experience in Otherworld in London. I'm going next week. And it's a VR experience, and you've done these before, and you're like, yeah, 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 that's cool, that's cool, that's cool. But this one actually moves people to tears. So the fact is, is that we're getting digital that can make us feel emotional. It can make us feel something for somebody that actually doesn't exist. And I'm not saying this is good or bad, but it's happening. And this means virtual spaces too. We all have conference calls constantly and there's some sort of boardroom or room in another in a space across the world. They don't usually look very good. So Hayworth, um, for example, uh, a um, commercial uh, um, furniture company is creating virtual spaces. So you can have an amazing virtual meeting room, but then you can also think about amazing virtual spaces, amazing virtual um, hospitality spaces or amazing virtual retail spaces as well too. And then also the digital beauty industry. It's super, super competitive. And beauty retailers are optimizing their stores to stay relevant in the digital age and turning them to beauty playgrounds. On the left is Harrods, newly renovated beauty hall. And it's got an immersive experience that includes um, luxury and also cult um, labels. And they've got a virtual play area with magic mirrors, a beauty concierge, and master classes. And then Giorgio Armani Beauty, their traveling global pop-up, offers a theatrical store experience with virtual makeup stations, a connected mirror, and uh, photo booths. And for my final slide here, I wanted to show you how extended reality can look for luxury. This is the trophy for the League of Legends, the online esports multiplayer game, and they're partnering with Louis Vuitton. So the championship final is on November 10th. You'll have to see who wins. And for this very um, most prestigious prize in esports, Nicolas Jesquier has designed unique champion skins for the games and also a capsule fashion collection. Vuitton has also designed the real life case for the trophy. This is the only real thing in the entire part of this presentation. So with this final slide, I hope that you feel that you have some pivotal information to help you win in design in retail in 2021. Thank you very much.